First at four, President Biden with an unprecedented move to change the look of the U.S. Supreme Court. You'll meet the woman who could be next on the bench. And here's Paul. Well, those Lake Huron Lake Effect snow squalls, they, they've kind of persisted a little longer than I expected today, but they are going to end. And then we have a warming as we head into the weekend. We'll have that forecast for you straight ahead, Jason. Also, the powerful connection between Dr. Martin Luther King and Aretha Franklin's family. An inside look at a special part of Detroit's black history. It's all next, first at four. Local 4 News starts now with a breaking news alert. Every appointment to the United States Supreme Court makes history, but this nominee is also breaking barriers. President Joe Biden following through on a campaign promise to nominate the first black woman to the country's highest court. And that nominee is Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. Let's bring in Kimberly Gill with more on this landmark selection, Kim. Yeah, it really is. Uh, Jason, good afternoon to you. President Biden has faced some criticism for promising to appoint a black woman, but he stayed true to his word. He said he found someone who's qualified, ready to serve, and she'll bring more diversity, of course, to the high court. I believe it's time that we have a court that reflects the full talents and greatness of our nation with a nominee of extraordinary qualifications, and that we inspire all young people to believe that they can one day serve their country at the highest level. Here are some things uh, we know so far about the nominee. She was born in Washington, D.C., grew up in Florida. She studied government and law at Harvard University. She worked for three federal judges, including Justice Stephen Breyer, the man she's nominated to replace. Jackson is married to a surgeon whom she met at Harvard. They have two daughters. Today, she talked about some of her beliefs and what she hopes will happen if she's confirmed. I can only hope that my life and career my love of this country and the Constitution, and my commitment to upholding the rule of law and the sacred principles upon which this great nation was founded will inspire future generations of Americans. Of course, her nomination now heads to the U.S. Senate for approval. Republican Mitch McConnell says he has to study her record, legal views, and judicial philosophy. But Democrats hold a razor-thin majority in the Senate. You'll see more reaction to her appointment when you join us for Local 4 News at 5. For now, Jason, we'll send it back to you. All right, Kim, thanks. Sure thing. Also breaking, a Detroit teenager has been charged as an adult in a triple homicide that left a five-year-old dead. It was last weekend when a man, woman, and her five-year-old son, Caleb Harris, were found dead in a home on Detroit's west side. Now 16-year-old Malcolm Ray Hardy faces several charges, including three counts of felony murder. A warrant request for a second teenager was denied because there is insufficient evidence to charge him, and he's now been released. Hardy's arraignment is set for March 1st. We also have breaking news from the CDC on how and when it will recommend people should wear face masks. The CDC is shifting its focus to limiting serious illness and the pressure on hospitals instead of uh, community case counts. The new metrics will loosen mask requirements for the lowest and medium levels of pressure, but the CDC says everyone who's eligible should still be vaccinated and high-risk individuals might still need to or choose to mask up. In areas where there's a high level of pressure on hospitals, it's recommended people wear masks in indoor settings, including schools. We just received this information. We're going to take a closer look at this new guidance coming up tonight at 5. In Michigan, the state is reporting more than 31 new cases of COVID in the past two days. The 1,500 a day average is slightly higher than Wednesday's report, but the seven day positivity rate is now under 8% which is the lowest since August. That does not include positive results from home tests, which aren't reported to the state. Finally, the state has reported 96 new deaths, with more than half of those from a records review. Russian troops are now targeting Ukraine's capital, and the White House just announced it plans to freeze the assets of Vladimir Putin himself. It's day two of the Russian invasion with gunfire explosions and warning sirens in Ukraine. And there are now reports of hundreds of people dead, and that number obviously only expected to increase. The Russian military says it has seized control now of a strategic airport just outside of Kyiv. Again, this is the largest ground war in Europe since World War II. The U.S. and other global powers held an emergency meeting today looking for ways to challenge Russia's Vladimir Putin without engaging in a direct war with Russia. 
Countries around the world are slapping the country with economic sanctions. Ukrainian President Zelensky is urging them to work faster. He is in hiding, and he says he's Russia's number one target. Thousands of Ukrainians are running for their lives into other countries like Poland, Romania, and Moldova, causing a refugee crisis now in Europe. Today, NATO agreed to send some of its troops to help protect member nations and offered a vigorous defense of Ukraine. We condemn Russia's aggressions in the strongest possible terms and call on Russia to immediately cease its military action. We stand with the brave people of Ukraine. We fully support Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, its right of self-defense, and its right to choose its own path. Coming up at 5, the worldwide impact of this invasion. We'll talk to Michigan Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin on that. And at 6, how the invasion could impact our state's auto industry. And if you'd like to go to clickondetroit.com, you can get around-the-clock updates there. All right, let's switch gears and talk about the forecast. It was a snowy commute. A little snow uh, this afternoon as well. Let's check in with Paul to see what is ahead. Yeah, the morning rush hour was certainly not pleasant. It was a real slush hour, and now we still have some of these lake effect bands coming in off of Lake Huron. Really, yesterday, every single model had this stuff shifting and pivoting eastward during the morning hours and not really a factor for the afternoon, but we still have these snow showers around, and you can see no maize sun and blue sky over the big house, not in this day. We have temperatures right now that generally are in the low to mid-20s. Wind chills are in the teens right now if you're heading out, so dress for teens. And through the evening hours, these snow showers will end. I, I promise you, they will end, and we'll have temperatures just slowly dropping to around 20 by midnight. So we have warming temperatures, though, coming in for the weekend. We'll tell you all about that in just a few minutes, Jason. And wait for that 11 o'clock live shot, Paul. Uh, <laughs> we also have an update on a mysterious leak near the Huron River in Flat Rock. It was Tuesday when a fisherman discovered an oily sheen on the water running parallel to the river. A spokesperson for the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy says the leak is still ongoing and under investigation. Booms have been placed in the water cont to contain this, and Eagle says those are working. Flat Rock's mayor has said there is no danger to the public. We'll obviously keep you posted on this. Hey, did you miss the orange barrels? Well, they're back on I-75 in Oakland County this weekend, and big time. Tonight at 11, MDOT will close both directions of I-75 between 696 and Square Lake Road. Weather permitting, demolition is set to begin on the overpasses at Gardenia and Lincoln Avenues. The ramps from both directions at 12 Mile were set to start closing earlier today. MDOT expects that freeway will reopen, though, at 5 a.m. Monday in time for your morning commute. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had many ties to Detroit, including to the family of music royalty. You might know Dr. King was close to the family of the late Aretha Franklin. Local 4's Everard Kasumi recently spoke with them about King's legacy and how they keep his memory alive. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was so close with Aretha Franklin's family, they considered him to be a part of their own. And the family member that I spoke with recently told me what it was like when she first met him, the times that he would come and visit Aretha Franklin's childhood home, and the moment that the family found out that he had been killed. I was the church secretary. That was the first time I got a chance to meet Martin Luther King. You met Martin Luther King? Oh, yeah. More than once. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was first brought to Detroit by her uncle, Reverend C.L. Franklin, Aretha Franklin's father. Brenda Franklin Corbett, yes. Aretha's cousin, was only about 19 or 20 years old at the time when she first met him. Now, at age 75, she remembers it like it was yesterday. It was exciting. I was nervous. He came to my uncle's house, which I was living there at the time. So I got a chance to meet him uh, as he was relaxing. And we all had dinner and sat around the piano and then Aretha played the piano and sang some more. What was he like? He Relaxed. Was, he was very, um, mm, I want to say normal. It, he didn't have that I am Martin Luther King. No, he was very relaxed. He talked to us and he would sing with us and uh, he was a good guy. Dr. King delivered his now infamous I Have a Dream speech here in Detroit first. Brenda was in attendance. Did you know at the time that that speech would have been the speech? No. 
You did not. No, 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 no way. Well, it did have um, a lot of impact because of what was going on as far as race is concerned. Um, I was happy about it. And uh, I was more afraid for him, for who he was, and for the people that didn't want him to be here. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. Brenda remembers the devastation the entire Franklin family felt, especially Aretha. She was upset. She was crying. We were all crying. I was crying. It was, it was like he was a family member. I, I was heartbroken and mad. The stories of the Franklin family relationship with MLK are passed down from generation to generation. As for Dr. King's dream being realized today. I don't think that he would be real, real happy, but I think that he would be happy because we have evolved a little better than it was when he first did the speech here in Detroit. Everett Casimir, Local 4. All right, Everett. Our coverage of Black History Month continues Sunday night with an hour-long special. Kimberly Gill and Devin Skillian will have several stories, including memories of the Green Book, and they'll take you back to the 70s and 80s with The Scene. Watch History for All starting 10 p.m. Sunday night.